And just like what I was saying earlier, you hear a truth, and because, like, for instance, I've always been, I always knew that it came from Bob Marley, and so it was like, oh, it, that sounds strange, coming from him, etc., etc., etc. So even a little statement like that can actually, you know, show us the importance of having the proper mindset. But the statement itself, it's a true statement, actually. And you will see in the scripture where Jesus says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. He says, If the Son shall set you free, you're free indeed. But, beloved, understand this, that that's all he does. Just like Abraham Lincoln did, he signs the Emancipation Proclamation. And Christ did that for the whole world. But just like then, it is now. It is our choice to walk off the plantation. Back then, we didn't have the soldiers or Lincoln representatives dragging slaves off into freedom. The choice had to be theirs. They had to realize, like we were always hearing, that Harriet Tubman saying that she could have freed them if they only knew. And if we only knew, then our mindset would be different. So, again, this evening, looking at rewiring the circuit of the mind. I will just jump right into it and give us certain formulas, certain tips, but I want all to be baited in this thought, beloved, that the principle is that we have to recognize, we have to understand, we have to believe that we're messed up from birth. It was that way. And there can really be no change unless we understand that principle. All of us, the Bible says, are seeing the control of the glory of God. It's like walking around with AIDS or some terminal illness and not knowing it and falling out dead. A dear friend of mine, this happened to her several years back. She was just walking in her office and she just had an aneurysm and she died on the spot. That's what we're talking about tonight, just thinking that we're okay mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and then boom, at a crisis point, we rupture. And the thought tonight is how to prevent that. Because it all stems down from the statement that we were saying earlier. It's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. It's easier to do damage than to actually heal. Like they always say, a lie will always travel faster than the truth. So we'll begin with a statement from the book, The Desire of Ages, and I'll actually be posting the study online and email it to those who I have the email address and if you know my number and call me and text me, I will definitely send it to you. We have a lot of scriptures, we have a lot of material. It's so there's so much in there. But we begin with a statement. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The sense of unworthiness will lead the heart to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And this desire will not be disappointed. Those who make room in their hearts for Jesus will realize his love. All who long to bear the likeness of the character of God shall be satisfied. Notice now, the Holy Spirit never leaves unassisted the soul who is looking unto Jesus. He takes of the things of Christ and shows them unto him. Here's secret number one, and actually the biggest secret of all. If the eyes kept fixed on Christ, the work of the Spirit ceases not until the soul is conformed into His image. The pure element of love will expand the soul, giving it a capacity for higher attainments, for increased knowledge of heavenly things, so that it will not rest short of the fullness. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. If you want something bad enough, you'll go after it. And 
This thing that we want bad enough is to stay focused on Christ. And we are promised that if we do hunger and thirst for it, we shall have it. But now pivoting to those lies that we tell ourselves or believe about ourselves so that we can't stay focused. That's the problem. Like this morning, you know, the devotional, we were looking at how you have these obstacles to pray, you have hindrances to believe in God and to keeping your eyes fixed. Like Peter did when Jesus asked him to walk in the water and he looked away. Here we go. Number one, lies we tell ourselves or believe about others. First one, I can't, as in I can't do this or I can't do that. And the thing about it is even though the word can't is literally in upper type it has a meaning, it shouldn't mean anything to us. We know why. Scripture tells us this. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Promise. So I can't should never be part of the Christian's vocabulary, the believer's vocabulary. Any person who is looking at can't, and we'll see another quote that says this, any person who's looking at can't will achieve can't. And you hear it long enough, somebody tells you this, you can't, you believe it, you tell yourself that, I mean, you need to try this, okay? Tell yourself even the most mundane thing. Repeat it to yourself over and over and over again. I need to learn this thing. Okay. I can't pick up this pen that's in my hand. I, I can't. I can't. I can't. And then your mind will start to believe the lie. So again, Philippians 4, 13 is a solution to that lie. Lie number two. Again, lie number one is a lie that we tell ourselves. Lie number two. Someone tells you that you have to do this or you have to do that, meaning that whatever they say goes because you don't think for yourself. You're always asking somebody else's opinion or advice or you're resting on it. And you're not listening to that inner voice. But God Himself tells us this in my favorite scriptures, Isaiah 30. 21. Listen. And thine ear shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it, when thou turnest to the right hand, and when thou turnest to the left. So, counsel, okay. While we should value and appreciate these counsels, understand this, that these are people's experiences. They are their testimony. You have to experience it for yourself and God tells you. We have an abundance of scripture. He tells you that you won't have to have anyone teach you because you know the truth. The anointing that is upon you will tell you. And so even as we're looking at tonight, the Holy Spirit will prick your mind and say, you know what? I do not have, you do not have to stay in this world. You can advance. You can go beyond because you are not stuck. No one should be able to dictate the path for you. You should do this and you should do that. And then we think, oh well, you know what? Then my mom, then my dad, then my brother, my sister, then my friend, they mean well for me. I give them that. But God means more to you and for you. And if he says this is the way, walk ye in it then I believe that it's better to walk in his way than theirs. Argument number three. I am two and a whole bunch of blanks. And for me personally, that was a good one. You look in the mirror and then you tell yourself these fantastic lies. Okay, I'm to this, I'm to that. Tall, short, fat, thin, ugly, Whatever, who's going to want me? I will never want anything. I am. And the reason why we do that, and it's a constant battle for us not to, because we live in this world where your senses are bumped.
bombard it. And see how important it is to rewind the circuitry of the mind? Because you're constantly bombarded with images of pencil thin people, airbrushed celebrities, not even a wrinkle on their faces. It's so perfect. Super human athletes who could do these great feats. And you look in that mirror and that image looking back at you and you're thinking, who am I? What am I? The Bible says, Psalms 139, 14 to 17. And actually, it's a beautiful chapter, that whole Psalms 139. It actually, everything that we're covering tonight, it speaks on it. Beautiful chapter. When you have time, read it, Psalms 139. But we're just picking out a few verses, 14 to 17, which reads, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are the works, are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Unfortunately, in 2015, our souls do not know right well that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I remember when I was a kid, and was, I went to visit this church for the first time, and there on the wall, in the kids, on the study room, was this word on the wall, this message. God don't make no junk. Now I looked at that, and I absorbed it. Remember when we said, you know, by beholding Christ. So I, I studied those words. Those words literally became me. Okay. God don't make no junk. So when we think that we're to this, we're to that, we're less than anything. Remember again the words. God himself tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. He goes on to say, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes will see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which is conti which is continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. God is just saying that he knew us before there was an us. And therefore, in our construct, in who we are. You see, the thing is, we again looking at us through imperfect eyes, through Hollywood and Madison Avenue and media, and allowing them to shape us when we should be listening to the voice of God. But again, that voice that inside of our heads saying that, oh, you need to be this, you need to be that, you need to be. Look at the celebrity, look at that athlete. Why can't you be like them? And God's voice is drawn out by all those millions of voices. You know, I learned something recently that just shook the very foundation of what I accepted as normal. I always studied, right? And, like, say, I have some soft music on, or just to meditate on it while I'm studying. But what are you doing? Just have music on. But I realized that you learn better, really. In silence, you can hear God's voice better, unobstructed. And so that's secret number three. Learning to hear God's voice. Try silence. I know we just love noise around us. I know people who can't exist without having some noise, a TV, a radio, whatever. You know, just the companion of people, just to hear some echo in the ears. But we need to learn in silence. Just like we are told that the songbirds that's in the cage in learn in that silence in the dark we need time alone with God to, sh to shut out all the different voices that's bombarding us and hear God say to us verse 17 how precious also are thy thoughts unto me O God how great is the sum of them so you will never hear God echoing at you just point at you at that mirror saying, you to this, you to that. Because he himself tells us that he made us marvelously. And again, I choose to believe God over what the media says. Number five, lies that we tell ourselves or believe about ourselves. Lies number five, I am nothing without fill in the blank without him, without her. Okay? I'm incomplete as a person if I'm not with someone. Again, God knocks 
that down to the ground, literally. Colossians 2.10, he says, and ye are complete in him. Talking about Jesus. And ye are complete in him. Complete. Once you are in Christ, you are complete. And it takes a lot to have Christ validate this in our minds because that's the image we always get. You need to be paired up. People are always trying to match make. And so, again, that relationship that needed to be fostered when you need to take time to yourself, you're like, oh no, what is society going to think of me? I'm 30, 40, whatever, and I'm still single. And you can imagine how that hurts the heart of our Savior. I mean, he looks at you as the you know, expression goes, all of that in a bag of chips, and you're like, okay, well, I know I'm a believer, I know Jesus loves me, yada, 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 but I need a man, I need a woman. Yeah, it's crazy. But again, that's the lies that we tell ourselves. And we don't take time to foster that relationship. And I believe if we did that, then when that person eventually comes into our lives, you know how much richer that relationship is going to be because you learned to stand alone with God and not having to say to lean on that person but you travel together as equals. It would be a beautiful thing because you have not learned to either be dominated or to be dominated. Think about that one. Line number six. This is, that's the whole one. Inherited lies. Meaning those lies that are passed down from generation to generation in families especially. Like, you know, like say great grandma was some famous whatever. And so all throughout her line, her legacy, her heritage, you know, the kids, the grandkids must be either whatever, doctors, lawyers or whatever, to follow in your footsteps. You know, and on and on and on. And if you don't want to, they'll throw the customer lines at you. Or you never amount to anything where you want to amount to be safe. For instance, just a mechanic, for instance. You don't want to be the president of the United States. You just want to be a mechanic. But because from generation to generation, the family has a name that needs to be uphold, you have to have respect for the family name. Don't besmirch the family name. But notice what the Bible tells us about inherited lies. Ezekiel chapter 13, 9 to 11. Ezekiel 13, 9 to 11. It reads, And my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writings of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and no others dug it with untempered mortar, generation to generation. Say unto them which dog it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a strong wind shall rend it. See what happens to lies? They eventually crumble to the ground. And so if we have inherited lies in our family, I mean, that's one of the greatest things that we have to do as a human being to live up to some legacy of the past. Not being able to forge your own destiny. That's crazy. It's crazy, really. And so we need to rewire the circuitry of our mind to let us know that as an individual, we have our own destiny to forge. God created us in a family, but God didn't create us as a family, created us as an individual. And eventually, 
these lives that have been handed down, passed down from generation to generation. Like the expression always goes, we need to start breaking these generational curses. It doesn't have to be. Our father or mother was this, that, and the other, and therefore that's why we're this, that, and the other. And it gets progressively worse. And just like some of us, we say that we don't want to bring children into the world because we don't want the lives, we don't want the legacy handed down to them. But we need to learn to rewire the circuitry of our minds. We, we need to have it in there that it does not have to pass on to other generations. It can be rewired. We're not stuck in a rut, and that's a promise. We're not. And finally, line number seven, cultivating lies. In other words, lies that we tell ourselves that are hard to get past, even in the face of over overwhelming truth. And that's probably the biggest thing that we're looking at tonight, lies that we tell ourselves. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with a hot iron. That's what happens when we don't believe the truth, when it confronts us and we deny it. We are actually searing our consciences. You know something to be the truth, yet you fight against it. Notice what Matthew 20, 25 says. But Jesus called them and said unto him, and said unto them, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Matthew 20, 25. Notice, says, Christ has given us no assurance that to attain perfection of character is an easy matter. A noble, all-round character is not inherited. It is not, it does not come to us by accident. A noble character is earned by individual effort through the merits and grace of Christ. So see what we said earlier? We are the ones who have to get ourselves off the plantation. Christ signed the Emancipation Proclamation for the whole entire race, but we have to emancipate ourselves from that mental slavery. Notice again, it says, God gives the talents. He provides the tools. But we have to form the character. Conflict after conflict must be waged against hereditary, hereditary tendencies we shall have to criticize ourselves closely and allow not one unfavorable trait to remain uncorrected, rewiring the circuitry of the mind. Close scrutiny, beloved, that's the key. Again, be honest with ourselves. Be humble enough to say, you know what, I messed up. And unless I, unless there's a change, I'm headed for self-destruction. So let me not say I cannot remedy my defects of character. Don't fall for the lies. I can't. If you come to this decision, you will certainly fail of obtaining everlasting life. Remember what I said earlier, if you focus on can't, you will achieve can't. The impossibility lies in your own will. If you will not, then you cannot overcome. The real difficulty arises from the corruption of an unsanctified heart and an unwillingness to submit to the control of God. Many whom God has qualified to do excellent work accomplish very little because they attempt little. We think mediocre, so we act mediocre. We think small, so we act small. We think we're nothing, so we act like nothing. We idolize the people that we see on the TV. We name their names all the time. But 
we still stay in our small circles, in our small surroundings, and never seek to advance higher. Thousands pass through life as if they had no definite object for which to live, no standard to reach. Such will obtain a reward proportionate to their works. Remember this, friends. Remember that you will never reach a higher standard than you yourself set. If you have a slave mentality, you remain on a slave plantation. If you have a slave mind, that's what you'll be bound with. You will never be set free. But it goes on to say, set your mark high. And step by step, even though it be by painful effort, by self-denial and sacrifice, Ascend the whole length of the ladder of progress. Don't stay on the middle ground of the ladder and look up and say, oh, that's too far, and look down and say, okay, well, I'm up here now, so I might as well stay here. This is good enough for me. Keep going. Faith has not woven its meshes about any human being so firmly that he may remain helpless and in uncertainty. Again, faith, F-A-T-E, has not woven its meshes about any human being so firmly that he need remain helpless and in uncertainty. And that's the heart and the crux of the matter tonight. We, again, speaking practically, you know, we, like I said, um, yesterday on devotion, we could speak so beautifully and wonderfully, you know, I can do this and I can have that, I can get this and but then when the rubber meets the world, when push comes to shove, and we come up against circumstances, it, it doesn't mean anything because we're like, well, I have three strikes against me, so therefore I can't improve. Or and just thousands of lies that we tell ourselves. But do you remember when we read it? Okay, it's more so us than any external influence, any external lies. We lie more to ourselves than anything. And if we tell ourselves a lie long enough, we'll start to believe it. It's all about perception. Opposing circumstances should create a firm determination to overcome them. Should, sure, but oftentimes it doesn't because we don't access the power that lies within us, like the Bible says. The breaking down of one barrier will give greater ability and courage to go forward. Press with determination in the right direction and circumstances will be your helpers, not your hindrances. And what we just read was from Christ Object Lessons, page 330 to 331. A lie is just that, a lie. There is no merit in it, no golden ticket to happiness if we clench onto it. I am like that which we just read. Faith has not woven its meshes about any human being so firmly that he need remain helpless and in uncertainty. However, how many of us do feel trapped by our fate? Again, the lies we tell ourselves. We need to shun everything that would encourage pride and self-sufficiency. Therefore, we should beware of giving or receiving flattery or praise. Watch what it does. It is Satan's work to flatter. He deals with flattery as well as in accusing and condemning. Thus he seeks to work the ruin of the soul. Those who give praise to men are used by Satan as his agents. Let the praise come from Christ. Go to Christ and then come from him to others. Christ alone is to be exalted. So we've talked a lot about how much of a problem we have and about the problems. So as we close out in the next few minutes, let us seek to elevate our minds a little bit and seek to come to a conclusion on this matter. So the question is asked, how do we ignore the voices? Simple. Okay. You just heard me say, it is Satan's work to flatter. He deals with flattery as well as in accusing and condemnation. 
So we look to be validated, we look to be exalted, we look to be elevated, and that's what it does that we tell ourselves that we need to be, we need to be, we need to be. And if we're not, we feel less than anything. Notice it says, Learn of me, Jesus said, for I am weak and lonely in heart, and you shall find rest. We are to enter the school of Christ, to learn from him meekness and loneliness. Redemption is that process by which the soul is trained for heaven. This training means a knowledge of Christ. It means emancipation from ideas, habits, and practices that have been gained in the school of the Prince of Darkness. I told you earlier, I'm going to say some controversial things, but it's going to be backed up. It is in your power, dear listener, to emancipate yourself from that mental slavery that you're in. Again, this training means a knowledge of Christ. It means an emancipation, you emancipating yourself from that slavery, from ideas, habits, and practices that have been gained in the school of the Prince of Darkness, Prince of Lies. The soul must be delivered from all that is opposed to loyalty to God. Notice now. So, we just talked about flattery and praise and being popped up. Look at the principle. So, we learned an example. Jesus said, learn of me. So, this is what he did. In the heart of Christ, we reigned perfect harmony with God. There was perfect peace. He was never elated by applause, nor rejected by censure or disappointment. I tell you this without a shadow of any embarrassment. I love being applauded. It puts a smile on my face when you say, oh, good job. It makes me happy when you acknowledge me. But it does me no good, really, because you could be the very same person who slapped me down in the next couple of minutes. And so, feeling elated by your applause, in the next minute, I'll be dejected and disappointed by your censure. Ultimate detachment teaches us that what the other person says or does does not validate me. Only Christ does. Again, as we saw in Colossians 2.10, you, I, we are complete in Him. Amid the greatest opposition and the most cruel treatment, He was still of good cheer. He was still of good courage. That's our secret. 